Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, I, wel I welcome you all, uh, 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 all of you, uh, to our uh, event this, uh, this afternoon. Um, I really appreciate everybody's uh, participation. Um, and this is very exciting for us, actually. I, we have three distinguished panelists here um, for this afternoon's program. Um, certainly, uh, you know, it is no surprise and it's, it's, uh, it's a topic that is on everybody's minds right now and it's hot kind of in the press. Um, but what we really wanted to do was take an opportunity to uh, create the space among some, uh, uh, some of our panelists who are experts um, with, uh, with a diversity of backgrounds to create an open conversation on this topic. Uh, we do also want to get some audience participation. So uh, towards the end, we've uh, reserved about 20 minutes uh, for Q&A. Um, but this afternoon will really be more of a uh, conversation amongst the panelists. Uh, so I wanted to go ahead and uh, introduce um, some of our panelists that are, uh, all of our panelists that are on with us. Um, Dr. Jaleel Abdul Adil, uh, who is um, uh, is uh, uh, the director of is a co-director at, uh, at the Urban Youth Trauma Center uh, through UIC, the University of Illinois at Chicago, and he has been a personal mentor to me and a consultant to Khalil Center uh, since its very inception. In fact, when we first even had the idea uh, way back, if you can recall, it was myself and another brother that came into his office and kind of talked through what we really wanted to do. And, um, and he has been really instrumental to us through our development as an institution, and I can say personally uh, for myself uh, as well. Um, and, uh, and, and, and Dr. Jaleel does a lot of work with um, urban youth trauma, and he works on uh, sort of um, you know, partnerships, community partnerships with many organizations. Uh, in providing trainings and supervision and um, and programming that is that is designed to kind of address uh, youth trauma, and he's uh, had a special focus on the inner city and in particular uh, in the city of Chicago. He's been here since uh, since '89, working working in the city. Um, then uh, we have uh, so I want to jump over to Sister Donna. Uh, uh, Sister Donna is the co-founder of Zakat Foundation. Uh, as you all know, Zakat Foundation is uh, a Khalil Center is a Zakat Foundation project. Uh, so they're our umbrella kind of parent organization. And uh, Sister Donna is also the uh, the wife of uh, the other the, the other founder of. Uh, of Zakat Foundation, uh, which is, and the executive director, Mr. Halil Demir, for those on in the Chicagoland area, uh, you all probably know them very well and perhaps even beyond Chicago. She's a, a registered nurse uh, as well, uh, doing a lot of work in the healthcare uh, industry. And uh, she's been doing and involved in a lot of community programming and efforts and also travels. She's been traveling a lot to the Muslim world uh, you know, Zakat Foundation has a lot of projects outside of the U.S., um, humanitarian efforts, wild projects, orph orphanship, Syrian refugee, and so she's been very heavily involved in those um, projects as well. So I, I welcome her to our, um, to our event, and of course, we've uh, come to know each other over the years um, through her, uh, you know, investment in Khalil Center, and, and helping consult with us and being privy to a lot of the programs that we've done. We've done a lot of programs together and, uh, and our relationships have grown, our family's relationships have grown over the years. Uh, and uh, next we have uh, Sheikh Abdul Malik Merchant. Uh, Sheikh Abdul Malik is a graduate of Umm al Qura uh, from uh, Mecca uh, in Saudi Arabia. Uh, he's uh, uh, he's uh, from from the U.S. of course, native native uh, to the U.S. And uh, uh, you know, I want to kind of say that in case people thought that he's a he's a, he, he's a kind of a Saudi imam that we brought in. <laughs> That's not the case. Uh, he was a former imam in Boston at ISBCC. Now he serves as a chaplain at, at Tufts University, and our relationship has also grown over the past uh, several years. 
uh, we've been corresponding and talking together about doing some joint and collaborative projects. Alhamdulillah, he had us over, myself and Dr. Rania, for a program in Boston, and we, and we had him here in Chicago. And so we've been collaborating on a couple of different projects and our relationship has grown. And so I felt, you know, reaching out to all of you all who are very intimately aware of Khalil Center and the work that we do. And, um, and I thought that we, we would really convene this, uh, this panel because at Khalil Center, we're really focused on, you know, uh, addressing uh, really important issues within our community um, and addressing them through kind of the mental health uh, lens, right? And so trauma is really sort of up our alley with regard to this conversation, as well as um, kind of the Islamic theological and, uh, um, you know, Islamic basis of trying to sort of, um, you know, uh, uh, put some perspective on this for our community as to how they can kind of um, understand some of these issues as Muslims here in America, uh, as well as what we could be doing practically uh, to be able to do better. And of course, we're not going to, the, 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 it's not, the, you know, the objective of this is not to end racism. I don't think that's going to happen overnight. Uh, certainly, we have a limitation in time. So, uh, you know, this is a, a very complex and multifaceted conversation. Uh, none of us, um, you know, believes that we're going to address all components, uh, as well as the African American experience itself is very diverse, right, and not monolithic. And so there's so many different layers and, and, and types of experiences uh, that, um, that, that, that need to be taken into consideration. So I make those disclaimers so that people do understand that. And really what we wanted to do is begin the conversation and hopefully we'll have some follow-ups that we'll do to try to address different aspects uh, of this issue, inshallah ta'ala. So I welcome you all, uh, uh, for, for, for joining us both as attendees, as well as our uh, distinguished panel. So I'm going to jump right in, inshallah, if, um, if you all don't mind. And um, as you're chiming in, uh, you can feel free to say more about your introduction or correct me if I've made any mistakes in introducing you. Um, and, uh, and so the, the first uh, uh, you know, kind of component that we wanted to tackle is the historical trauma. We know that this um, has a long history, that this is not an isolated event that just happened with George Floyd um, and the riots and, and the protests. Uh, there is a long history with regard to uh, the uh, African-American struggle here in the US. And, um, and so we wanted to kind of open with giving a little bit of contextualization, looking back in order to sort of understand the present a little bit better. And so I'm going to open it to, uh, you know, pose this to Chef uh, Abdel Malik, if he wants to kind of uh, uh, open the floor, give us a little bit of context and background. And of course, the panelists know that, you, you, you know, this is a conversation, uh, you're more than welcome to kind of jump in, um, you know, add uh, feedback or, 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 or points uh, to each other's comments. Um, and, uh, and we'll slowly kind of unravel the issue as we go through uh, the different major talking points and, and, and subtopics that we really want to address for today. So, Fadlan Sidi, Abdul Malik, Barakallahu Fikum. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbi wa wala. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad al-Fatih lima ughliq wal khatim lima sabaq nasir al-haqq bil-haqq bil-hadi ila siratik al-mustaqim wa ala ala haqa qadrihi makdaran azim. Jazakum ala khair, Human and Khalil Center for allowing me to be with you all this afternoon, insha'Allah. Um, with regard to any historical event or anything historical, it's impossible to summarize it in any short period of time. We're talking about the last 400 plus years of the history of a people, of my people. And so just to really help give context, I thought it would only be befitting if we started with sharing this timeline so that we can see together what we're talking about and specifically what it is, where I'm talking about. And so just to, before we begin, we have American slavery and segregation. 
1526, so generally speaking, we're talking about the history of enslaved people in America. We're thinking about 1619. There was recently New York Times, big project. But actually, in 1526, the first enslaved Africans were bought here with Spanish explorers, about 100 of them, and they were happened to disappear within about a week's time. And the reason why 1619 is really uh, an important date in our history as Americans, but specifically as the children of these enslaved Africans, is because bef that is when the category of slavery uh, became something that was a thing. Before that, people of color, um, Af people of African descent, or specifically Africans at that time, they lived in this sort of homogenous way with Europeans and, and the natives of this land. So, but the goal of the Europeans in coming to America were purely of capitalistic origins, of capitalistic intent. And so after the genocide of the indigenous, the natives, at around 1619, that is when it became a law, it became permissible, legal, to bring enslaved Africans who were stolen and kidnapped or whatever means they were bought to this country to serve as slave or enslaved peoples. And so this, this history, this, this struggle is one that has a long history. The struggle of people of color is something that the activist and scholar Vincent Harding, he said that it's sometimes powerful, tumultuous, rolling with life, at other times mandering and turg, covered with ice and sows, and seemingly of endless winters, all too often streaked with the running of blood. And I mention that because we're talking about people like Omar ibn Said and so many more that were taken out of a very comfortable life in West Africa and then enslaved, chained, and bought here to a whole new land that spoke nothing. And so it didn't speak the language or the culture and then forced into slavery. And so from 1619 all the way to 1863, this was legal. All of this time, this was something, something where people were bought halfway across the world, across the Atlantic, for this 339 years and lived in this fashion. They lived enslaved and trapped. And it wasn't until 1865 that the Emancipation Proclamation was signed and slavery was eradicated and deemed illegal. Now in 1806, it was illegal to bring slaves, in, to, to bring enslaved peoples to America, but that still happened. And after that, in 1865, when the Emancipation Proclamation happened, then that was when pe the children of these enslaved people, or perhaps even some of these people that were bought from Africa, were then set free. And I use air quotes here because this setting free, the Emancipation Proclamation, wasn't something that we have like the internet of today. It was where a law was passed. And not everyone knew. People still lived in this for multiple years after the Emancipation Proclamation was, uh, was signed. But then the Emancipation Proclamation is signed. African Americans and the children of enslaved people now are no longer um, forced to live in bondage and forced to live in this chattel slavery. And then we have this miraculous period that is known as the Reconstruction Era. From 1865 until 1877, African Americans or Black Americans lived and thrived in, mul in a multitude of different cities all over the United States. We had what was in, in known as the Black Wall Street. We had politicians. We had banks. We had businesses that at 1877, a little over 10 years later, due to racist and other means, was completely destroyed, burned to the ground. And so the reason why I'm trying to paint this picture so that we can understand, again, that our topic of today is historical and generational trauma. We're talking about people that lived up to 339 years enslaved, finally able to have a sense of quote unquote freedom, and then are able to thrive because of it. And at just 10, 12 years later, racist, destroy, burn, and demolish all of this that has happened. And so then 
this time of segregation. This is when Jim Crow laws come about. This is when laws of legal segregation now are brought. Before you had where um, in the constitution, African-Americans and the children of this enslaved Africans are considered three fifths of a human being. They're not even deemed legally as full humans. And now we live in a time, or they lived in a time between 1865 and 1954, which really could continue on into 1965, where there is legal segregation between this newly founded, first time, very modern concept of race, where it was illegal to use certain restaurants and to drink from certain fountains. It was illegal to ride in the front of the bus or to even get married to someone that was of European descent while you are a person of African descent. And so now we have 89, more than that really, until 1965 is when the board, board um, 1963, 1965, the board, of board versus education is passed and then the Voter Rights Act is passed. But then it doesn't stop there. You know, in our very post, um, our postmodern era, we like to think of slavery and we like to think of 1965 happens, Voter Rights Act, um, Board versus Education, and the children of enslaved Africans are now free. You can live. And then we had eight years of Obama, and we had this sense of, mashallah, you know, there's no restriction now. It's not held, but that's really not what happened. And from 1965, as soon as slavery, um, excuse me, segregation is deemed illegal, from then until at least 1977, it was legal for banks to segregate and to redline is the term that is used, but to have to not give loans and restrict where people of color were allowed to live. And so this then creates the modern ghetto. If we have certain areas that are deemed illegal or they're not deemed illegal, but they're not able, black folk are not able to buy houses in those areas, that then segregates our school system because you're only going to go to school where you're able to and therefore because it's all people that it's not a diverse um society people are really starting to get on their feet then this affects the tax dollars that feed those schools then there is if you're not able to buy a house then you aren't able to generate wealth and therefore you aren't able to create generational wealth that you can then give on to your descendants and that really is crippled and stifled stifled and then because you're really just coming out of segregation it's a very challenging area era and so that goes until 1977 where that is then deemed illegal it still happens but okay let's just say for argument's sake 1977 from 1971 until roughly 2009, we have the war on drugs, where people whom drug laws or mass incarceration, where they're now racially and systematically subjugated to incrimination, starting with Nixon, then into Reagan, and then, and then, and then, where only then further destabilizes the black community. It only further, it economically, socially, and in every way form possible. And so this is just a very brief, brief um, overview of what we're talking about, of how generationally things have happened, where it then impacts what people think about it. Du Bois talks about in The Souls of Black Folk, the Freedman Bank, just for an example, something tangible that we can take from this. The Freedman Bank was a bank that was started so that the ch people who are no longer slaves in this reconstruction era are allowed to invest their money and now start to save money, invest money, and then potentially grow capital. Due to multiple reasons, this was no longer able to happen in the bank foreclosed. What that means is the money that people had then put into a bank no longer exists. Everything, your life savings that you put, thinking you were gonna get interest from, obviously we know that's haram, but thinking that you're gonna get money from, that your investment's gonna grow, now all of your savings are gone. And Du Bois talks about 1909, that this alone made people, and then he continues on talking about it in, <clears throat> excuse me, Philadelphia Negro, this eradicates the trust that black folk had in banks. And we no longer can trust banks and therefore we're no longer saving in banks. And that made for certain people, obviously there's no 
monolithic um, culture amongst African Americans, even again, even in segregation times, the boys is talking about this, but this created a sentiment where if we can't trust banks, then we're at least going to spend our money on what we can have right now. And so again, that's just a brief overview that I would love for now um, my co-panelists here to really just jump in and how talking about historical and generational trauma. Well, um, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Well, please, please. Thank you. You know, and I'd like to, l let me just add my two cent in there. Uh, that, that was a wonderful introduction, I want to say. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, historically speaking, let's, let's also add in, if you want to add a little bit about health care. Mm. Uh, when we talk about s segregation, when we talk about uh, historical access to care, how many people, how many African American people have died because they were not allowed, not only, well, they weren't allowed access to care. There was no access to care. Segregation in hospitals. I mean, we could go on and on and on. Segregation in hospital settings, segregation in the military. Uh, my father coincidentally was one of the first black Marines in this country. Um, but many people died. And I, I think for those of us who don't know this information, we really need to just think of it and accept the fact that we have actually lived in our own U.S. apartheid. We have lived and survived and thrived under apartheid. Many women died giving childbirth in this country, uh, through accidents, all kinds of usual trauma circumstances uh, where they were not allowed in the hospital or they might maybe get there, but no one would treat them because they didn't want to touch a black person physically. So that all adds in. That's all I got to say on that one. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. A'udhu billahi min ash-tahan ar-Rajim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala sayyidi Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa salam. Rabbi shari sadri wa yasli amli wa akhlu laqtatan min lisani yafqaw kawli. Fama ba'ad. Assalamu alaikum panelists and audience. And alhamdulillah, jazakallah khair to the Khalil Center for opening this space for what we want to be honest dialogue. And I'd like to just chime in a few points related to the historical trauma to go along with what my fellow panelists have said. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Quran, Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu kunu qawamina bil qisti shuhada alillahi wa law ala anfusikum. That we are obligated to stand forth for justice. Oh, you who believe, stand forth for justice, even if it's against ourselves. And as we know from the ayah, it goes on to point out it's against ourselves, our parents, our kin, whether they're rich or they're poor, Allah will protect us both. This is our responsibility. And so I'm pleased to see a panel and a center which is encouraging us to fulfill our responsibility to stand up for oppressed peoples. And I'm going to just highlight a few talking points to extract from the historical record. And since we said we're going to have an open, honest conversation, let me say it bluntly. First of all, African-American communities have gone through historical trauma. Now, there are many definitions of historical trauma. The brief one I'll offer here is it's the cumulative, collective, emotional, and psychological wounding of an individual or a generation that's caused by a trauma, like a genocide, an enslavement, or an ethnic cleansing. Now, what we have heard historically has been an African Holocaust that conservative estimates said 12 to 14 million Africans were taken in the transatlantic slave trade and only a fraction ever made it here alive. And those who did make it here alive were subject to what we are now calling in a sanitized term, systemic racism actually was white supremacy in furtherance of capitalism that was specifically founded on anti-black racism. There was rape, there's mutilation, there's murder, there's thievery of wages, there was confinement, there was torture. There were many things which were done which damaged the psyche of this community, which as Sheikh Abdul Malik mentioned, coming from a very grand and glorious existence in Africa. Some of the recent research being done by Dr. Bilal Ware, 
uh, Sylvia Diop, I think is how it's pronounced, Slaves of Allah, and others pointing out that there were both free, thriving people of African descent, as well as laborers who were brought with early Dutch and Spanish colonizers. So before the United States was even a thought in somebody's mind, African people, including African Muslims, who came from a strong, rich, and proud tradition of Islamic adab, of Islamic scholarship, of literacy, of science. And this was at a time when Timbuktu, Mali, Ghana, and those areas were above and considered the international center of Islamic scholarship and administration and civilization. So you juxtapose coming from a very, very advanced country and being kidnapped and all the other atrocities trapped and taken to a new place where not only were you not afforded some of the basic humanities, which is unconscionable in the mind of a civilized person, but you were subjected to daily, permanent, and intergenerational enslavement, humiliation, and really Holocaust slash genocide. Keep in mind, some scholars, you can look up Joy DeGruy's book, Post-Traumatic Slave Syndrome, and others, talked about this historical trauma fractured people mentally, emotionally, and physically throughout generations. And this was passed on biologically, psychosocially, and culturally. Okay, the reason I say that is we really got to get a grip on the enormity of what has happened throughout generations that has led up to the behavior, the despair, and the oppression that we see going on today. Now, again, because we are having an honest conversation, we need to talk about the relationship between not only the larger system of white supremacy and anti-black racism, but the police. Please note, historically, the first police in this country were people who functioned on behalf of slavery as slave patrols. They were joined by people who were the unofficial extensions of militias that would only function to control, oppress, torture, and when necessary, kill people of African descent who would not agree to be subservient and silent in the face of their oppression of the enslavement system. As Muslim, this should particularly touch us because some of the first organized, effective, and ongoing resistance to systematic racism and oppression were by Muslims. To the extent that they would pass laws beginning with the Spanish to try to ban, this was the first Muslim ban, to try to ban Muslims from even being brought over here as slaves because they refused to surrender and submit to their existing anti-black racist system. And so this is part of the Muslim legacy in this country that we need to embrace, standing up for justice. And so when we see things in Minnesota, we're looking back to a 600 year to sometimes a uh, uh, 700 year context of people being denied some of the basic rights that humans deserve, even down to the most basic thing you could do as a human being, which is to grieve. When we look at law enforcement, there are many articles out there. I encourage you, again, as uh, Sheikh Abdul Malik said, we can't go through all of it here. We're just giving some, some uh, food for thought. Okay, but there are articles which talk about just the relationship between the police and, and people of African descent in Minnesota. We won't forget about Philando Castile. We won't forget about many situations which have happened that have caused for the harassment, racial profiling, the discrimination, and yes, the murder of people of African descent, including African Americans. And it's no surprise that even, uh, this might surprise some people, even in my lifetime, in some states, it was still illegal to even intermarry. And in my lifetime, to even intermarry. And the police are merely the physical implementation of state policy. And I wanna, I wanna caution us, because I've been raised in the North, I spent part of my life being raised in the South, and I was going back and forth in between because of my family. 
racism, white supremacy, white terrorism against people of African descent was never only a Southern problem. If you look at the history of this country, the South perfected it and built this economy and its social structure based on it. But don't forget, the North was complicit industrial, from an industrial perspective, of partaking and benefiting and perpetuating this same system of white supremacy and black oppression, including trading the labor and the products as the industrial center for the country, and even more so. The West was founded on a supremacy that even some people of African descent were taken as slaves or against their will or through an extension of Jim Crow out into the West to help settle the West, not as co-settlers, not as, as fellow human beings, but as forced labor. So this has been a national problem. Racial profiling, false imprisonment, police brutality, militia terrorism, whether it was a white supremacist gangs, whether it's a Ku Klux Klan, the Citizens Council, and all those other organizations, this is not a new phenomenon. So when we see now today, police still do not have the proper respect for African American life, particularly if you're from the lower income, more marginalized urban populations of which I work with every day. Do not be surprised because this is a 600 year pattern of which we're still seeing the continuous manifestations today. I will see if you plant a bitter seed, you're gonna get bitter fruit. And the thing as a Muslim, we have to feel like in the, in the path of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who walked through Mecca and saw the oppression and didn't say, let me just take care of me. Let me just take care of mine. Let me stay out of the way. Hopefully they won't bother me. We have to rise up to this responsibility of standing with and for people who are oppressed as Muslims for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I'll pass it along to one of my other panelists. I, I, can, I can really appreciate that, um, uh, Dr. Jaleel, Zakla Khair, for um, really kind of keeping it real and, uh, and, 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 and letting us know um, what really happened without kind well, of sugarcoating it I and without uh, putting in the layers. Um, Sister Donna, it looks like you want to kind of add something. Um, uh, please, please welcome. I would, I, I would agree. Um, I, I would agree, concur with um, what Dr. Jalil has has stated. Um, we we all have a responsibility to stand up here. You know, I've I've asked uh, a few very close friends and colleagues uh, on board who. Not Muslim, um, but who are very dear and close friends to to the social justice cause, and uh, you know we 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 have to get on board here. I think all of us. There's a lot expected of us uh, to to get in line with this social justice uh, and what's right and wrong. We we know what's right and wrong. We, we know that. I wanted to add another important uh, factor uh, as as we went through history. I want to encourage everybody to look up the history of the NRA, National Rifle Association. Um, how it was founded, very easy to just, just throw it in, Google it, NAACP stands for National uh, oh my God, National Advancement of what talks about how the NRA was actually found, and it's rooted very much in having a sense of controlling guns uh, uh, that, that the newly freed slaves would, would, uh, would get. It was, it was also a way of monitoring how many ex-slaves could get guns. And that's something that a lot of people really are just not aware of, of the founding of the NRA. Another quick point I want to bring up, uh, and I'm sure it's going to come up anyway, but we need to talk a little bit historically, we need to talk about lynchings. Uh, lynchings, uh, you don't go on as often. I mean, an actual lynching, rope lynching, but, uh, but we've had a few in the last several years. I think it was one in Texas. Somebody can correct me with that one. But from 1882 to 1986, there were 5,000 lynchings in the United States. And, here, and I'm, I'm rounding up, rounding down a little bit here or there. But what's very important, I think, for everyone to know here is that out of those 5,000 lynchings, and you know, give or take a couple of hundred, so I'm just rounding to keep the numbers easy. Out of the 5,000, 4,000 were black, 
of people of African descent. But here's a surprising note. A little over a thousand of those people were actually white who supported uh, the freedom of blacks. That's, that's something that, you know, people, we, we need to know that. In the 60s, uh, our struggle, our struggle is African Americans was very much supported uh, by Christians, Jews, whites. You, you know, it's, it's, we have a sense of social justice and what our responsibility is. We, we all know this. And this is a very good time. It's groundbreaking. We're segueing into something where we all have to assume our responsibility here. We cannot, we cannot do this alone. So I just wanted to add that real quick about uh, the lynching. Last thing, 25% of those lynched, 25% of that, uh, let's say 4,000, okay, were actually accused of, uh, of sexual misconduct. And we're seeing a lot now of, of, of how the lies are continually being bought up, unfortunately, by whites and by women. Uh, uh, that are people, they're just very, very on board to calling the police on black men, continually, left and right. So that's it. Zakhar, um, uh, Sister Donna, actually, I wanted to kind of transition into talking a little bit about the generational aspect of this, right? I think we've talked about the history of how, like, the early history is so horrendous, right? Um, and, but he, here we are, here, here we are today, there's certainly remnants and systematic inequalities that continue and that persist today, right? When we're talking about uh, the, the plea bargains, I mean, even stories like my own, sh you know, experience of just being shocked as a Canadian when I moved to the U.S. It, certainly, Canada is not absolved of racism, right? But when I, but but just the sheer magnitude of these ghettos, right? Going into the south side of Chicago, and I was invited to uh, join some brothers at a masjid. It's just that invisible borders was just so striking to me that they're not all that invisible. And you have almost, you're leaving into another America, like you're in another country. So it was very striking to me. So I'm very cognizant of the fact that, that this is absolutely something that is continuing. And we can see with what's happening with police brutality and perhaps with Donald Trump, there's sort of like, uh, uh, the curtains off. You, you see what I'm saying? With Obama, maybe there is a little bit of a, um, a, a, a beginning of a false sense of those who don't live that experience, right? That live outside of that world that, you know what, we've come, we, we've come really far. But I want to speak, I want to get your guys' thoughts on this issue, uh, on the generational aspect. I mean, on the panel, panelists, we have, pe you know, we have a diversity of age groups without calling out anybody's physical, you know, with the numbers here, because I know, you know, uh, so sometimes it's a little bit more sensitive when you, when you talk about age issues. Um, but certainly I know. No, 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 I'm 61. <laughs> go, go ahead. I'm a very proud 61, mashallah. I got a lot of stories. Thank you, brother. Hulan, for respect. And, and, uh, yeah, and, and you see myself and, uh, and, uh, and uh, Sheikh Abdul Malik, uh, you know, are in a different generation than you all are in, right? Uh, the two of you. And so you all have seen things that we've read about, right? And, um, and so I just wanted to kind of speak to and understand what is the generational impact of this? Maybe, you know, Sheikh Abdul Malik, you could speak from like the newer generation, you know, that's coming up right now. And what your experience of all of this stuff, like Dr. Jaleel was talking about Sister Donna's seen some of this stuff in healthcare physically, right? Like that, that, that sort of transition. Dr. Jaleel's talking about, you know, marriage, uh, uh, intermar interracial marriage being outlawed during his lifetime, right? And so what is it like for you um, uh, where we are at today uh, uh, from a generational kind of perspective? You know, it's it's interesting because you know I'm I'm I've really got Du Bois in my mind, but even post emancipation, there was a generational gap between people who lived through enslavement and people whom the Du Bois says are like the stories of their childhood. 
And so now post 65, people who lived through the civil rights era versus my generation and today, um, it's very easy for me, I'll speak about myself and not my um, generation or age group, but it's very easy for, for me to forget about Rodney King because that was in 93 when I was little. Um, and that was back when video cameras were on your shoulder. It wasn't like what we're seeing today where we had 17 police officers beat a man on camera, all walk. Um, and then the subsequent riots and, and, and protests that happened afterwards in, in all over the country, but most specifically in LA. It's very easy for me to forget about the work and the efforts that had to go in through in the civil rights era. era. So the reason why I mentioned that is because when I see protests and what's going on across the country, um, because of my academic training, one, it makes me feel like, where's the organization? But speaking specifically on generational trauma, I was blessed to have grown up in a, in a situation where I, I myself, nor those in my immediate social circle, never experienced um, police brutality or incarceration. I was never in jail or anything of that sort. But because of the, the fact that I'm connected to others, and I know people whom have, and I've been pulled over and seen the racial prejudice and how I'm treated in a car. I naturally have um, anxiety when I see a cop car on my back or if a car looks like it could be a cop car. I don't know why people buy Ford Explorers, but <laughs> if that car is behind me and it's just a black Ford Explorer, because in Boston, those are the, the cars the cops drive, my heart rate automatically elevates. And just, okay, again, I've never experienced um, any police brutality but having have seen that, that's what I feel. Now, my son is seven years old. He's never seen anything close to what I have. But when he sees those lights, you can see his heart rate elevate. And this is what, when we're talking about generational and things that are inherited, that's, those are the type, that's generational. He's literally just taking it from seeing Baba and Mama when we, perhaps, are we getting pulled over? What's going on? All right, everything, turn the radio off. Where's your, put your license on the driver's board because I have to get ready and th those are things. So just speaking from my generation, those are some of the things that you inherit. Um, but yeah, I I'll let my co-panelists speak. So I'll like, so I'll, I'll chime in here. Uh, I will say I'm a, Proud 55, but I'm 55. <laughs> uh, and alhamdulillah, I think it's an important point to note here that I probably could, could be considered those who grew up in a post civil rights era or were able to benefit from the struggles that my parents, who were very active in the civil rights era, by the way, um, that we should have seen the benefits of that. And there certainly were some subtle changes, there were some symbolic changes, but there was no structural changes to the extent that relieve the masses of the suffering that they were going through. And my parents always raised me, even though we were a middle-class background, middle-class African-Americans, both my parents got their master's degrees, education was something that was expected uh, in my family. We knew we were connected to a community that struggle still remain. And I think it's very important that we haven't highlighted that some of the reasons that the structural problems continued is again because of the law enforcement presence that remained in the African American community, even as they were trying to struggle through systemic racism. Don't forget how closely law enforcement worked with uh, the, the, the uh, white supremacist groups. You certainly can't forget, and it was put in the chat, which is important, there was the systematic targeting of African American leaders under the counterintelligence program under J. Edgar Hoover, which systematically sought to disrupt, destroy, and otherwise neutralize the African American liberation movement, which really we're just asking for basic promises to be fulfilled. So when we look and we see the absence of the, the African Americans able to fundamentally root out systemic racism, it is because of the presence of continuing policies. It's also because of the link between the policies and the police. Martin Luther King Jr. didn't die from old age. Al-Haji Malik Ashabaz didn't die from old age. Here in Chicago, Fred Hampton did not die from old age. The Black Panther chapters around the country, they didn't close because uh, of uh, their own inertia. There was a systematic persecution which happened, which was to remove and eliminate any leaders who, in their words of the documents, 
from the government, a black messiah who could rally the masses to actually achieve black liberation. So it's important to mention that. Why are we still dealing with this? Because some of the resources have been taken from the communities as they've tried to organize themselves. Now, as far as me, um, I have, from an African-American middle-class background, college educated, doctorate degree, I have been racially profiled. I have been harassed. I have watched police brutality live before I had the cell phones. I have been in places like when we were in college, there used to be uh, called a black college spring break where we went to Virginia Beach. You know, Sister Donna, you may remember this. Uh, we would go to Virginia Beach as all the black students from around the country to kind of hang out and, and have some solidarity. And because Virginia Beach did not want that large number of young African-Americans coming, they used to turn the police loose to harass and, and, and bother. And I saw brutalized even African-American students for minor things such as loitering, standing around, not moving along fast enough, not complying with directives, just trumped up things to harass, profile, and brutalize. And I've, I've been walking through DC when I was in Howard University, and I came around the corner and I saw an African-American male who, because he was jaywalking, was beat up by seven police. And when we were standing there as young students saying, what is going on, paralyzed with fear, they threatened us if we didn't move along fast enough. And trust me, they weren't joking, okay? I have been driving down the street um, with my friend pulled over with lights and guns drawn saying, we heard there was a crime by somebody who looked just like you. And only because I was taught and had the talk at a very young age to never ever leave your house without your license is the only reason I didn't get handcuffed and taken downtown without even a second thought. And I learned these things because I know despite my so-called middle-class background, despite the so-called post-civil rights era, you have to try to survive contact with law enforcement when you are a person of color, particularly African-Americans. And so I, uh, similar to, to Sheikh Abdul Malik, I, alhamdulillah, so far, I've never been in jail. <laughs> I've never been arrested, alhamdulillah, so far. Uh, uh, but you, the presence of the police and connection to people who the communities I work in who are lower income, you feel that fear, intimidation, that disrespect, that harassment. So then when you see what happens with George Floyd and all the other incidents, you're not surprised it's almost a reinforcer. And to, to Sister Donna's point, the, the window we have of an opening of conscience across the country, that's something that's always been there. Trust me, we talked about history. We could also mention John Brown. Okay, we, we could mention the people who are part of the Quakers, the Underground Railroad. People have, of conscience have always been there. We just, as Muslims, we have to encourage ourselves to really step up, join, or even challenge ourselves to exceed, taking advantage of this window of opportunity to really fully understand what people of African descent have gone through and address the systemic racism, including, but not limited to, the police misconduct so this can stop. If I could just jump in, you mentioned something, um, Dr. Jalil, about um, about the issues and how it, they, they sort of make us feel in the systemic problems. I think I would be remiss to mis mention how the Immigration Act of post-65 allowed people to come to this country and come with education or come with opportunity and check off on the census box white. And so I can't speak to any particular person's experience, but what we do know is that that drastically changed the dynamic between Muslims in this country and therefore then made it so that people who came from Islamic cultures or, or Muslim backgrounds then had the ability, the language to say, well, this is Islamic and this is how Islam should be, which then within our smaller nucleus of a Muslim, of a Muslim community created segregation it, within our community, which then created an uncomfortability. Um, I, as someone who's lived overseas for 10 years, alhamdulillah, um, and speaks Arabic fluently without an accent, bi ta'ala, 
and worked as an imam in one of the biggest mosques in New England have been in the presence of other imams who won't speak to me in Arabic. And will refuse, like, it, it, they just refuse to do that. Sim and there's no other reason because the other imam next to me, he's speaking to him in Arabic, but switches back to English to me. I, I can get down with y'all too. <laughs> um, or going to places in the assumption being that, you know, am I Muslim? I was, I, wallahi, I was in the Kaaba, in the Haram, the Masjid of the Kaaba sitting down reading a green mushaf with a thobe on, looking at the Kaaba. And a brother came over to me and after he found out where I was from said, are you Muslim? And I just looked down at the Quran, I looked at the Kaaba, I looked at the Quran, I looked at the Kaaba, I was like, bro, really? <laughs> like, you asked me that. And so these sentiments within our community um, creates distrust and creates systemic issues as to why post 9-11, everyone's kumbaya, but before 9-11, we really didn't work together. And so I think we just need to mention and name that to the in, within our community, what colonialist and colorist ideas do we bring into our experience that then impact how we interact with our brothers and sisters on an intra-faith level. So, and, so, and, Sister and Donna, I wanna... actually, I just want to invite you, Sister Donna, to also, uh, you know, you live in a predominantly, uh, you know, Arab community, right? I mean, not to single out any particular community, but it's just representative of many communities where there's a predominantly non-African American base, be it South Asian, Turkish, Arab, or whatnot. But I know that you certainly have a you know, wealth of experience in growing up in various communities, but in particular in a very kind of, um, uh, you know, heavily, you know, dense Muslim populated kind of area as a, as a minority, as a Muslim in those areas. So I was wondering, I, of course, I want to hear from your comments that you want, that you want to make, uh, but also if you get a chance to sort of touch on your experience living as a Muslim, right, who also you embrace Islam, right, and then you also married an immigrant too, <laughs> so, mm -hmm. um, so, uh, uh, so it's just you have uh, such an interesting kind of intersectional experience, lived experience um, that, um, that I know I personally don't have, but is very unique, even among African Americans, if I can say that as well. Well, I, I, and, and, and I want to, I, I need to say um, thank you to my friends and coworkers who are here and joined us on board uh, just for the sake of social justice and just out of their love, I guess I could claim that for myself. They are, they are not here because they're Muslim. Um, they are here because they are great people who stand for social justice. And, and I want the panel to know I, I greatly appreciate my my friends here, my interfaith, interfaith friends, my colleagues, my girlfriends, whomever. Uh, in regards to that, well, my God, Brother Human, I got a lot to say, so I'm going to try to uh, tune into that. Uh, this is a very difficult subject to approach because of because of my age, because I was one of the because I was the group of African American children who were bust in. My brothers, God bless them, both struggled very much through the civil rights movement. Okay, so I reaped the benefits, if you could say that, but I, I was a bust in black kid. I'm from an area south of Chicago called Markham that was actually built a year, we moved, my parents moved in a year to the day when I was born, literally. Uh, that area was built for blacks. We found out 30 years ago that area uh, is built on a toxic dump site. So we've had, just on our block alone, we've had six people come down with cancer. Uh, my mother was one um, and, and other, other people that lived on the block too. So that's, that's a whole nother subject. Uh, I've had three lives um, as a black girl, okay? Then as a young Muslim lady, then I've had my life as a Muslim immigrant. Now, and, and my girlfriends who are on here, they know the stories very well. I even had one go with me to Ikea just to put a scarf on her head to see what it was like to be Muslim. She said, I want to try this out and see what it feels like. Okay, she's not Muslim. Uh, um, so those three lives, um, it's, it's very difficult. And then, uh, you know, my husband is not African-American. My husband, yes, is from Turkey. So we have the whole biracial element in regards to the children in and outside of the Muslim community. Uh, colorism, I'm gonna summarize it real quick and Imam said the same thing when we spoke the other day. Colorism plays a very huge role 
uh, I see it also in the workplace as a registered nurse. How many times do people assume that I'm housekeeping or I'm food service? Okay, even I have a big badge that underneath my name that says RN in, in bold black letters, but I must be housekeeping or food service. Okay, I have had people request a different nurse because they didn't want to see me come in with a scarf on my head. Now, on the other hand, when we flip over and we think of colorism, and anyone out there who's African American knows very well what I mean, uh, I can get through a lot of doors because, because my blackness is not offensive. I'm not dark enough to be offensive. Um, all my life, I've grown up with people telling me, oh, I, oh I, I forgot you're black. I totally forget all the time. You're just like, you're just like us. I have, I have heard that and seen that outside of the Muslim community. I have seen and heard that inside the Muslim community. Um, I've, I have stories that go on and on and on, all, all the way around. Um, out on the street, it's always assumed that I'm an immigrant and I don't speak English uh, until I say a few choice words and regain myself and then they realize my English is very good. I've even had a nurse when I, and I'll call him out on it, when I was training at Christ Hospital, I had a preceptor, which is my, would be my educator to orientate me, train me to the floor. Even my own mother told me, Donna, she doesn't know you're American. She doesn't think you're black. She would go through my charting and correct my English consistently. Uh, I've, I've, I mean, I've got a ton of stories. And I must add also, uh, because my experience is so unique, I've had the pleasure or downfall of experiencing uh, international global racism. I lived seven years in Switzerland. Uh, until my German got good enough, I was, uh, I'd been spit on. I was physically beat. If I had been pregnant, I probably would have lost the baby because I got meat in my stomach. Um, we could not find housing for at least four years because no one wanted to rent to us because we were a Muslim. People who did hear me speaking English to my children in Switzerland couldn't understand how I spoke English. And when I told them I was African American, they couldn't fathom that either. Um, it got so bad. Finally, I told my husband, I can't live here. I said, Dr. King marched too long and many others, uh, Reverend Ralph Abernathy, so many others, so many whites, Jews, Christians had died for our cause in the 1960s through the civil rights movement, movement. And I said, I just can't live here. My people fought too long for me to live here and live like that. I had women in grocery stores run their shopping carts into my heels. Um, I had a neighbor actually complain about, about one of our daughters who would hear the dog in the apartment barking and my little girl would bark back and the neighbor actually said to us, well, our dog only likes Swiss children. I mean, I could, I could write a book on the stories, on stories alone. Uh, um, it, it, it goes on and on and on. In our community, um, we, we have to deal with this. We really have to deal with this too. We have to get these liquor stores. We have to get these liquor stores out of our community because it's, it's giving a very bad impression and, uh, uh, to, to our non-Muslim brothers and sisters of what they think of Muslims. That, that's another point. Everybody has a very bad liquor store owner and they don't remember the person's ethnicity. They only remember that these people are Muslim. Um, that's a lot. I hope I answered the question. Yeah, no, uh, so, so subhanAllah. I mean, I think this section really was an opportunity for us to look at some, uh, some of the personal narratives of, of you all as panelists coming from the diversity of experiences that you've had, but converging on the fact that this very much affects your day-to-day -day kind of experience in your lifetime. It's a story and layer of your lives that can't, can't be forgotten or can't be ignored. And yeah. Let me, let me just say this too. Uh, that, thank, thank you so much, Dr. Jalil. I appreciate your patience with me. I appreciate that. Uh, let me just say this again, my, my colleagues and friends that are, that are on board, I actually had one go to bat with me because I was being discriminated against 
as a Muslim woman who wears a scarf who they thought was an immigrant, where she actually went forward to management through HR. She had my back on that. I even had a doctor, a Hindu doctor, tell me as I was going to California for to visit family, he says, you know, when you get where you're going, you can take all that off because nobody really knows who you are. Hmm. He was insistently, consistently uh, 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 picking at me. Last experience I, I have to share with you guys, I worked 15 years at Little Company of Mary. Everybody here knows where their hospital is. I worked on several floors. I'm a very well-trained, by the grace of God, a very well-trained and diverse uh, a nurse. And um, it was 15 years before they actually knew I was African-American. Mm. How did that happen? September 11th happened. And uh, I, just told, I just told all my colleagues after 15 years, I said, you know, there's not only Arabs, Arabs are a minority in Islam. A lot of people are Muslim and we're not uh, Arab. Where are you from? I'm from Markham. Anybody who knows Markham knows it's, it's a town again that was built for blacks. And they said, really? I said, yeah. And the minute that came out, I get a totally different set of treatment. Mm -hmm. You go from being treated as an immigrant to getting treated much worse. And I, I've said before, when people cannot see your hair, they cannot categorize you based on how kinky or how straight your hair is. You will, if your hair is kinky enough, you'll get the Negro treatment. If it's not kinky enough, they want to know who in your family is white. So this is pretty much the experience of being a, a, a woman of color who happens to be Muslim and who crosses over the color line. My colleagues who were African American, but who were darker, got treated much worse than I did. The minute they even looked angry, everyone was afraid of them. And we're all nurses. So we can't even add the, the, the gender issue in it of, uh, of men. And I imagine being a darker African-American man, and, and I, my two brothers here can speak on that. I imagine being a darker African-American man, that's even worse of an issue because your color is definitely a threat. Uh, and that, that's something I want people to know. Can, can you testify to that, please? Um, and and yeah, let me, let me mention that not only being darker African-American perceived as a threat, but as someone who played college football, darker, very muscular, extra large African-Americans walking in groups are really threats. See, and I got to experience all of that by Allah's grace to maintain my connection to what goes on with the masses. And I, I wanna just connect the quick dots. I know we're gonna start heading towards some take home points, but one, the racial profiling didn't start with 9-11. The police and mass incarceration and mistreatment while you're incarcerated didn't start with Guantanamo Bay. And what you're hearing is what is happening when there is an intersection of ethnicity, African and African descent, also religion coming together. But this is really a wake up call for us to look at what has been happening systematically for years and step up to the plate. And I'm just like you, Sister Donna, I'm very proud of my coworkers who have been, I, I won't even, I won't even joke, they've been more militant than me, <laughs> or as militant as me, and who are the non-African Americans, European Americans, Latinos, Asians, who are all sacrificing and speaking up, saying we've got to reverse the systemic structural racism and violence reflected in police brutality and murder, but not limited to that as some of the things that uh, Sheikh Abdul Malik has mentioned with housing, employment, healthcare, and everything else. I just want to also emphasize though, we're still in the midst of the siege. So I personally was grilled all day yesterday by my 11 year old daughter saying, what is going on in this world and what are we supposed to do about it? And she's still gonna to have to deal with this Right? These are not old stories that we've gone. This is, she's concerned. She grilled me all day yesterday when we were hanging out. What is going on? Why are these things happening? What are we supposed to be doing? What are they going to do to us if we start speaking up? What did the Prophet Sallallahu do? Also with my 19-year-old daughter, who is a college student, but is not immune to this and is immersed in a lot of these online and offline protests. And my 23-year-old son, who I didn't just have the talk. Okay, I continue to have talks about how to survive contact 
but potentially explosive racial dynamics, not only with police, but with larger society. And yes, we need to keep in mind, there's, all, there's a whole window of consciousness which is opening across a wide spectrum of society. I'll say from, from my 55 years uh, that I have not seen since, but I'll say even beyond what happened with Rodney King. There's a different energy, there's a different scope. You see the international demonstrations. I think we really have to start talking about what are we gonna do moving forward to capitalize on this awakening and this potential window of opportunity so it just doesn't fade away, just like what happened after uh, the Ferguson, Missouri uh, situation. I'm in Chicago, we have a long history of police torture. Okay, it's well documented. John Burge, infamous, uh, used to torture uh, people of African descent here when they used to arrest them. They just exposed Holman Square, which is a few blocks from my office in Chicago, where they were taking people when they arrested them and torturing confessions uh, out of them. We're in the city of Laquan McDonald, okay? So we have a lot of work to do, but I do think we have an opportunity by Allah's grace to start making a difference from a wider swath of society than has happened uh, in, in recent memory. Yeah, I, I wanted to um, transition Zakhmal Khair to all of you for these, um, you know, uh, kind of eye-opening uh, experiences that you can speak to. And I hear um, all of you guys saying that uh, some of the things that you've appreciated a lot is individuals who have really stepped up to the plate to really have your back at times when you were being isolated, at times when you're being harassed or attacked. And what I'm hearing, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, and as we're transitioning into the takeaways of what those, like we have, you know, 75 people, you know, 80 with the panelists. This is a large group of people here. And one person can have a circular impact, right? Have a domino effect. And so the question is, what do we do? Because we don't want this event to be just a, you know, a storytelling event, right? That's not, you know, this isn't... Um, uh, uh, kind of, you know, voyeurism, like we just kind of opened up a camera and let, let, uh, uh, let, let all these black people speak. You see what I'm saying? And hear their stories. And we had a good time. It's like a Netflix movie, but in our community, and we just walk away and go to bed and we forget about it. The question is, you know, what do we do and what roles do we play and what responsibilities do we have? We know as Muslims, we have responsibilities, right? And, and when you learn of something, you can't forget it anymore. You see what I'm saying? And so the question is, what responsibilities do we have? And I'm hearing a little bit of forming alliances, sort of connecting and making sure that this momentum turns into this movement that just doesn't die, but has a trickle down effect where it starts to change things and the way things are done. Can we speak to what could be what could we be doing? And obviously we're not gonna, you know, we have what, 10 minutes, you know, uh, 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 15 minutes at most to do that. So obviously we're, we're not even gonna scratch the surface. And if I could uh, just jump in. Yeah, please. Um, I think it, as Muslims, it, it would be remiss, especially with Khalil Center and everything that our three panelists, if we would not mention the Prophet Sallallahu and the early Muslims who are supposed to be our Qudwa, are supposed to be our example that we're supposed to be taking from. And Islam is, uh, is we know, gives the ultimate examples for everything. But Islam is a tool that we have to utilize in order to see impact on us. Because even amongst the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu there were prejudices that were said and how the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu answered them was by say, when, when one companion told another, Ya Ibn Umm Sauda, O son of a black woman, the Prophet Sallallahu said, Fika jahiliya, you still have some pre-Islamic ignorance in you. You still have some ignorance in you. And so the first thing that we have to do is really have some introspective thought about ourselves and understanding what is going on. When Malcolm was asked by the young white woman, what can I do? He said, go back to your community and work on inside your community. And so for us speaking to a, a diverse community, we need to go back to ourselves. What do I think when I'm around 
my black brothers and sisters? What do I think and feel when someone with a hoodie on is behind me and I'm walking down a dark alley? Or what do I feel like when I see someone who, whatever the case may be, we need to start eradicating and learning about ourselves, uplifting um, the, the, the organizations that are doing anti-racism work, but learning about the problems we got. Because if we don't fix our house, then what are we doing? Um, and my last point on that is one of the, something that was very, very important during the civil rights movement was they had, had brotherhood and sisterhood and companionship amongst the people they were with and together on the front lines. If we don't have good connections, if we don't know each other and we can't trust in each other, remind you the, the Southern Baptist Christian, the Southern Christian leadership movie that, Malcolm, that Martin was a part of and led was both black and white. What is because they knew each other and they trusted each other, they were able to sit on the bus. They were able to, or, or boycott, and they were able to sit at the counter because they knew each other and they trusted each other. So my thing is when we need to reconnect with our tradition, not just in a superficial reading and like, yes, Islam is anti-racism, go ahead, Bilal, Musa was black too. No, we need to understand the, the ills and the ignorance that we have inside of us and work to eradicate that lilla for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that we can be better people, better Muslims, inshallah, people whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves. And I would, I would uh, thank, thank you so much for that, Imam. I would, I, I would, uh, I would add that is, uh, that it is our responsibility through our faith tradition. And I appeal to my uh, Christian and Jewish friends who were here. It's all, I, and I, and I've actually put it in a in a small chat note. We we know what to do. We know what to do by our religious faith tradition. You know, we have to do this. It's the it's the right thing to do. It's the God like thing to do is to stand against oppression and social justice, social injustices. We, we, we all know what to do, um, but, but we need everybody on board, which is exactly what, you know, you're saying that too. We need everybody on board. What's, what's wrong for another is, for, for one is wrong for another. What's that, what's that little parable? Everybody knows that story where, you know, they come knocking on the door and they took away one neighbor and the person looked and then they came and they took away the other neighbor. You guys know what I'm talking about? It's, it's a long story. I don't know if it's related to the Holocaust or whatever, but they came and they knocked and they took and took and took until finally they came and knocked on one person's door and there was no one there to stand for them. This is what, this is what we're talking about. And I keep saying over and over and over again, it's a quote from Mother Teresa, one of the worst diseases in the world is to be nobody to everybody or anybody. And, and, you know, we, we, we have to move through this. We need help. We have to stand in our faith traditions. We know what that is as Muslims. Our brothers and sisters who are not Muslim, they know what that is in their faith tradition too. But we really are all in this together. And um, that leads me to a job I actually had to quit at Christ Hospital because I did say that, that we're all in this together. We, we really are. You know, what happens to me will happen to someone else. Um, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. For no, no, I, I, I was just going to say that, that that's a good takeaway for uh, I, I, I want I want our listeners who speak Arabic, I want them to please reconsider the word Abid, Abid, Abida, I want them to consider that when you translate it, it's absolutely horrible. It hits every single African American Muslim or African American non-Muslim who understands the root of it, it's, it's, it's so misused. It's so misused. The way it hits my ears is as an African American woman, it's extremely painful. Just, just, as the word, just as the word black in German, it's hurtful. I'm not even gonna say it, Google it. That's not what they mean, but the way it hurts our ears, it, it, it's gotta change. We live in a country where, where that word carries a lot of weight, a lot of painful weight. So I'm going to appeal to my Arabic speaking friends, stop using that word. You want to you want to walk away with something? Stop using that word. Try try to understand what what this pain might be like cuz we've carried it, you know, as Dr. Jalil said, we've carried it for 400 years. You don't see it in our faces. I'm not going to just talk to you about it if I work with you. Why would I? You know, really why would I? But I know stories from my grandmother and my great grandmother and the great grandfather and the great great grandfather. And as I said yesterday at ICC, has anybody ever thought for one second, look at any ethnic group of people, Polish people look alike. You can tell when someone's Polish. I don't mean look alike in a bad term. I'm saying there's certain 
ways that people look look similar from different parts of the world, right? You know, there's there's a Moroccan look, there's an Egyptian look, there's a a West African look, there's an Ethiopian look, there's a German look, there's a British look. It, it, I mean, it is. These are just genetic features, not in a bad way. I mean it. But has anyone ever thought why we don't, why African Americans don't look alike? Even American Indians, if you know enough, you can tell who is Navajo, who is Sioux, right? Anybody ever thought out there ever thought why we don't look alike? We don't look alike because of what happened to us. So this carries over in our genes every single day. We don't, we don't look alike because of rape. We do our genetic screening, our numbers are very high. Of, of, of white blood, that's a reminder that something happened. These were not consensual relationships. So long story short, the, the more people read, the more people take the time to understand or just ask one of us. Some of us are more willing to talk about it than others. The more you understand, the more you'll understand. That I think that's a good thing to take away with. I, I did take photos of a, a suggested uh, reading list that that I think if could, could interest uh, someone out there, some of them are books based on sociological perspective, some are fiction, uh, right. just, we'll, so we'll, we'll, we'll send it out, this. we'll send it out, inshallah, to all of those who had RSVP'd, and if you didn't, then go ahead and email, I'm going to type it in, community at khalilcenter.com, um, if you didn't end up RSVPing and you want that resource list. Uh, Dr. Jalil? Just quickly, I'd, I'd like to add that the Prophet Sallallahu said, if anybody sees something evil, you should correct it with your hand, if you can't with your tongue, if you can't with your heart, until you could get to the other two. So I would hope that we would rise to this occasion and speak out against some of these systemic, structural, anti-Black racist problems which have happened because they do affect not just African Americans, but, but humanity. Because just as easy as an oppressive dynamic can be applied to one group, it can very easily be shifted toward another. And I've even seen it done against poor white. Okay, so we want to make sure we address this. So my, my three things I suggest is one, as we've said, please let's educate or really re-educate ourselves about the history of African people in this country, African Americans and African Muslims in this country and around the world. So we could think differently about the dignity that are deserved and what was taken away through historical trauma. Secondly, we need to incorporate this into our daily conversations to change the atmosphere. This is not something that's only for a webinar, only specialized books. We need a challenge on the job, in the home, uh, amongst family gatherings, in public. Be very active and very assertive to speak against and act against all of these types of injustices which happen, even at the personal self-sacrifice. Third is for us to emulate the example of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as Muslims, which is our Uswa Hasana, our model, is that even, even when there's sacrifice, there's struggle, it may not be popular. Now everybody's taking, you know, saying Black Lives Matter. Well, there was a time that was like a curse word. Now all of a sudden things are changing. Really for us, we should do what's right because it's right, not because it's popular or not because it's accepted or not because it's become a buzzword. And I do hope that this notion, which is different, we're talking about structural racism, systemic violence, white supremacy, and its derivatives, which include black self-hatred, are things that we could start addressing forcefully until we can eradicate them, inshallah. And eradicate doesn't mean we pretend we'll be perfect. Eradicate means we commit to doing what's right, including when we make mistakes correcting ourselves instead of justifying it, institutionally or otherwise. You mentioned something, Dr. Jalil, about self-hate. And, um, and, you know, I think I can remember in psychology when they had the African-American children being given a choice between the white and the black doll. And they ended up choosing the white ones, which kind of speaks to this sort of subconscious internalization. I always wondered, and my guess would be that if you did the same thing uh, with um, Arab or South Asian or whatever, else that you'd get the same outcome. And the reason why I say that, I want to, I want to speak to this because there's something very unique about uh, a sort of um, uh, white uh, uh, and European problems that have been trans, uh, that have also uh, kind of uh, plagued the Muslim world that 
I think affects us as, Amer as immigrant Muslims or the children of immigrants. And that is that um, this is a global phenomenon, right? What, 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 what ended up happening was that, um, you know, the U European and white customs were always trying, uh, was seen as superior and it was brought on the back of colonialism to the Muslim world. So the Muslims in general as a whole have suffered trauma, right, as a result of this. And so the closer you get to things that are further, the, the further, you know, the closer you get to things that remind you of that which is um, not European, right, the more discomfort that you end up having, even if it's subconscious. You see what I'm saying? We've forgotten our own culture, our own customs, our own, and that's not to conflate it with the, it's not nowhere near the African-American experience, but it get, does give a unique characterization, and I can speak as a children of immigrants, of how the psyche ends up working in really internalizing, right, that European by default is best. You see what I'm saying? And when I was in, um, uh, you know, when I, when I give a talk in Turkey, for example, one of, jokingly, some of my colleagues told me, uh, you know what, because my Turkish isn't that great. And he said, uh, I said, you know, I'm going to struggle to speak in Turkish. They said, it's okay, speak in English. It'll be more scientific. It'll be more intellectual, right? And I was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> right? So people will see it that way. Do you see what I'm saying? And so now when you have things that are further and further away from that which is white and European, the greater the discomfort. And so I think that self-hate among the Muslim community exists, and then it gets scapegoated on certain people in our community as well. The darker your skin, for example, the less European you look, the less European you exemplify, right? And so I think there are those aspects, and I'm just kind of speaking to those from like me, people like me who grew up with, um, uh, in those environments that struggle, right? And I think those are things that we have to recognize that may be part of these hidden biases that we may not always be kind of fully attentive to. Um, but I wanna give a minute each to uh, some closing remarks, if we can, inshallah. And, um, and I wanna respect the time of everybody who's on here, the panelists, as well as the audience to keep to our time, inshallah. Jazakum um, <clears throat> uh, hold, hold me to my minute, okay? Mm -hmm. Um, when, when you talk about, the, again, this global racism that, that has come up, I just got to make this last point because this is going to be very shocking. Uh, at least I, it was to me at any case. When I'm in West Africa, I'm considered white. I get charged a white woman price. Um, I get treated better because I'm considered white. I'm considered white because of the nature of colonialism. And as people intermarried and the numbers of the colonialists were lower, they took the biracial kids and pulled them to their side and considered them white. Okay, so I'm considered white. Can you imagine Brother Human as a therapist and also Dr. Jaleel? My first trip to Rwanda and I walk in there as a proud African American woman feeling myself very black, irregardless to how, what someone thinks or whatever. And I find out I'm getting charged the white woman price. I literally had a meltdown you know, if we're going to get personal. So yes, race, racism is global. Everything you're saying is absolutely true. And I appeal to everyone, think about this, develop some type of understanding, a minute sense of empathy to understand why we're so angry and how we're trying to work through the trauma of all of this in generations. Thank you so much. Uh, Sheikh Abdul Malik. Um, I, I thought Dr. Jalil was going to go. Um, my closing remark is uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells in the Quran, اعدلوا فإن أقربوا للتقوى. Be just because that is better, that, that is closer to piety or God consciousness. If, if I was to part with anything that we should all engage in the study of our tradition, but not just the superficial study, but the, the work, the internal work on our own nufus, all of us, black, white, regardless, immigrant, non-immigrant, so that we can be people whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with, and so that we can do the work that is required within our families, our small social circles, and then inshallah, we can uplift society that way. Jazakallah khair for having me. The only thing I would say is thank you all for taking time out for this serious and hopefully provocative 
discussion we had establish at least one thing new to inform your mind and one thing new or one thing we could do better to stand forth for justice so this doesn't become just a moment in time, it becomes a movement, not a moment. Yes, thank you all uh, too. Uh, uh, you know, special thanks and Jazakumallahu khairan to uh, the panel uh, for taking the time out. Uh, you know, we all came together on short, uh, in, a, in a very short period of time. And I know that um, you all kind of extended yourselves and making yourselves available. I really appreciate that. And also to all of our listeners and all that joined uh, on, on a Sunday afternoon. I know Sundays on a weekend, people got a lot of things to do and, they, and, I, and, and it definitely shows that people take, took this ser topic seriously enough to devote the time to sit in, to learn, to reflect and to be a part of this program. And I know that this is just the beginning, inshallah. And, uh, and, I, and I hope that this will, um, you know, be uh, beneficial for us. Jazakumullah khairah. Barakallahu feekum. Wa akhiru da'wana. And alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.